Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm Pam Cressy, President of Alexandria Historical Society. And thank you for coming to Old Town and to the Lyceum, where I believe the Alexandria Historical Society had uh, decided to have its very earliest meetings here and cared a lot about it. But I think in 1974, when our current historical society uh, began, I don't know that the Lyceum was fully renovated at the time because it was really using bicentennial monies that, that all of this renovation that you see occurred. And if you look at the historic photos of the building uh, before the renovation, I think it was close to demolition like many, many of the buildings, especially on, Wa on Washington Street, that were torn down because they were derelict or just that there were different kinds of uses that were anticipated in the 60s and 70s. So we're very fortunate to have the Lyceum as this public meeting space uh, operated by the City of Alexandria and Office of Historic Alexandria. So before our speaker this evening, I wanted to um, commemorate George Coombs for a moment. Uh, George was um, our go-to at the Barrett Library Local History Special Collections on Queen Street for many, many years. He was also a board member of the Historical Society. And unfortunately, he passed away, and unfortunately, nobody realized it for quite for a few for a few days at least. Uh, he was working at Mount Vernon, and I believe it was the people at Mount Vernon that discovered that he had passed away at, at his home, and so. Um, we really don't have any connection with his family or um, we're not aware of other ways of, of um, remembering George. So we wanted to do it a, a bit tonight. And also in our newsletter, you'll see tributes written by some of the people in this room. And uh, I just, I wanna just read out a couple. Um, uh, Bill Dickinson, a former president said, whenever I had a question about Alexandria's history, that could not be answered by consulting standard guidebooks and histories, I consulted George, tossing him question after question about the evolution of the city, how differing neighborhoods developed, who were the past leaders, and what they did or did not accomplish in our cherried historic buildings. Um, so on and on go the praises. Ted, who's here tonight, said, at first I tried to find things on my own, but gradually more and more I began to go to George for helping me find sources that I needed. Ted now is a go-to person for finding sources. So thank you, Ted, for um, contributing to George. And I know you contributed to his life. You learned so much more that he could digest um, and, and has published. And Ted has a new book out as well, so you want to look for that. Um, uh, geographer, uh, a person, uh, geographer in training, but he's the archivist at Old Presbyterian Meeting House, uh, Donald Drummond says, I know that GW is Alexandria's George, and I have come to emphasize his George's contribution to our nation's history, but George Combs was the person one went to among the subset of folks working to discover the honest history of Alexandria. Uh, George had a twinkle in his eye, and he had a very dry sense of humor, and he also did enjoy uh, a good drink. And I actually ran into him on New Year's Eve at one time um, randomly, and then we made it kind of a tradition to meet on New Year's and toasted. I think he liked a martini. Um, so tonight we do have some sparkling ciders, and I actually walked out without my glass. But I'm wondering if we could just have a toast to George, uh, just hold up anything. I, that's all I'm doing. So to George, and I think in Alexandria we say huzzah, huzzah, huzzah to George, and thank him for everything that he's done for us that we're still learning from. So tonight our speaker, Tatiana, is going to tell us about the 500 block of King Street, which you may not know right off the bat. It's not like Fort Ward or Jones Point, a place like that. It is where the city courthouse currently is located, uh, if you have a reason to go there. Uh, also, La Madeleine's, Starbucks, and I believe an optician's uh, eyeglass store is there. Um, but when I started uh, in Alexandria 46 years ago, uh, that was the, the string that came with the job. Um, I thought it'd be really cool to be a city archeologist because there really weren't many in America, if any, at that time. But I knew there were ones in Japan and Europe and I thought that sounded wonderful. But they said, you have to dig a city block 
uh, in three months. That, w that was the string that came with the job. And I thought, I knew that was, I would fail. But I kind of, I guess, crazy youth. I thought I'd fail, but I'd fail quick. And then I could go on to study wonderful questions in Alexandria. Well, um, something happened. The construction did not take place on time. What's new about that? But it wasn't due to archaeology. So if anybody tells you archaeology held up the courthouse or the library or anything else, you tell them it's absolutely not true. But um, it got held up, and we could only dig six parking spaces at a time. Now, this was taken later, but they wanted to keep using the parking lot that was there because they had torn down the historic structures as a part of urban renewal. So if you can imagine it, the 300, 400, and 500 blocks were torn down um, three quarters of those blocks for urban renewal. And this was the last block left. And so we kept digging. And this was how the volunteer program started because there was just two people, Kathy Beidelman and myself. We got a, a small grant. Uh, we couldn't find too many trained people. So we put an article in the Gazette packet, anybody who'd like to volunteer, dig privies, uh, classify and wash filthy, dirty pieces of glass, ceramic, animal bone, and seeds, or do historical research on microfilm, please call. Now, we thought we'd be lucky, maybe two, three, five, ten, if we were lucky. 150 people called the first week. A lot of people like privies. And I'd like to introduce you to a gentleman that showed up almost the first week of that ad um, and continued to dig in the 500 block. John, can you stand up? This is John Glazier. And he, <laughs> <laughs> he may have excavated the materials that Tatiana is going to uh, talk about tonight. Um, and, uh, but we had to give, we didn't let you stay down there very long because his passion was so great, he could actually overdo it. So we had to winch you back up again. Um, we also were, uh, well, it was Portner's Restaurant. I think it's changed now again on St. Asaph Street. That was the old fire station. We used that as the lab. But all the artifacts were s water screened and washed before they came up. They were really filthy coming out of the deep privy wells. And they were carried by buckets over to what was a open lot, which is now kind of their covered um, atrium area of that restaurant. And we water screened it. And at one point, uh, you know, there's a lot of dog walkers in Alexandria. A lady with a small, white, fluffy dog would come by there every day. I don't know why. And she complained that the materials coming out of the privies that were sloshing over the buckets got on the sidewalk and her dog might be damaged. So we're a dog-friendly community. We Clorox the sidewalk every single day. That was a volunteer job, too. Um, over time, I don't know, Tatiana, do we have a current number on the collection size from the 500 block? Mm-hmm. Well, we were estimating a million from the 500 block, Th a million. Uh, now, that does include animal bones from diets and, and materials like that, but I don't think it includes every eggshell and every seed. So we did not, uh, so, but I wanted you to realize the efforts that it took of hundreds of people to dig through summer, winter for a year and a half and then Steve Shepard, one of our city archaeologists, did his dissertation on some of those materials. And they have pretty much, um, uh, where they've been exhibited and people have looked at them, uh, as far as I know, no one else has done another scholarly work on it. So I want to thank you deeply that this is done before I passed away. And 46 years later, from when John and I first started digging the site, um, that you have these revelations. So thank you for your subject and the, the topic that you have. And I also wanted to thank three women who volunteered to do the historical research. Uh, Nancy Senawal, Vivian Mitchell, 
and uh, Ruth Sinberg Baker. As far as I know, they have all passed away as well, 46 years later. But Ruth is the one who alerted me to the Jewish uh, inhabitants of the 500 block of King Street and the miraculous story of their lives, their businesses, the beginning of um, Bethel, and really a, a, a very um, strong Jewish community in Alexandria. So I wanted to just recognize uh, their efforts as well. So now, uh, I wanted to, if I, I've got lots of pieces of paper here um, to be organized. Um, so I wanted to um, introduce Tatiana Nicolescu, Ni yes? Nicolescu, I have practiced. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's not too many syllables, though. <laughs> I just need to say it more times. Um, Tatiana is one of the ci city archaeologists and is the collections manager for these three million artifacts. Um, and she holds her bachelor's degree in physics and archaeology from UVA and uh, her master's and doctoral degrees in anthropology from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, her work focuses on how individuals and communities constructed social identities through things and space and the ways in which people navigated a rapidly changing racial landscape at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and so that's our talk for today. Uh, and somehow we leaked out of your picture, but she's right here, so you get the real thing. Um, and I don't think your photo was touched up at all. I think you are just as wonderful and, and exciting looking as your photograph. So thank you very much. So thank you all for being here and for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this topic with you guys. Um, so like Pam said, I'm Tatiana uh, Nicolescu, um, and I'm one of the city's archaeologists. Um, and yeah, I manage about 3 million artifacts um, from over 250 archaeological sites from across the city. Um, I'm really excited to take you on a brief journey through one really small part of Jewish Alexandria history. Um, the research we'll be chatting about tonight is part of a larger project that sought to take another look at older archaeological collections in order to try to answer current anthropologically driven questions. So this research would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of Pam and many other Alexandria archaeologists, including Fran, um, throughout the years. Hundreds of volunteers who have dedicated uh, thousands, if not millions of hours, to preserving the city's buried history, and the advocacy of the Archaeological Commission and grassroots support of many other stakeholders. Archaeology in Alexandria is truly a community-driven project and our ongoing preservation and interpretation of the city's history would not be possible without this support. So we'll begin really briefly um, by really briefly and broadly summarizing American Jewish history and then discussing the history of Alexandria's Jewish communities using a couple of vignettes. Uh, we will then turn our attention to the Rosenfeld family who lived at 518, 520 King Street during the first two decades of the 1900s. Their lives serve as a microcosm of Jewish experiences outside of major cities at the turn of the 20th century. The historic and archaeological records provide details into the lives of Max and Jenny Rosenfeld, their family, and their community. Specifically, we will learn more about the economic choices they made, how the family carefully balanced tradition and innovation while creating new cultural paths for themselves and their community, and their somewhat fraught position within the changing racial landscape of the early 20th century. So in the summer of 1856, Rabbi Isaac Leeser traveled to Alexandria and reported that this town's ancient uh, residents are all in good circumstances. Um, an important religious and uh, cultural leader, Leeser viewed the freedoms possible in the United States as an unprecedented opportunity for spiritual revitalization and cultural excellence. He shaped American Judaism by authoring and translating several pivotal theological works, publishing the first American Jewish periodical, the Occident newspaper, and founding Maimonides College in Philadelphia. Leeser tirelessly advocated for uniting disparate Jewish communities around shared traditional beliefs and practices in the face of the growing reform movement, 
and he had really good things to say about Alexandria when he visited. In 1865, about 10 years after Leeser's visit, the Jewish Messenger newspaper noted that Jewish matters have improved beyond description in the past three years in Alexandria after the arrival of federal troops during the Civil War. Over the next few decades, a small group of German and later Eastern European Jewish families came to call Alexandria home. They started businesses along King Street, established a benevolent society, cemeteries, and synagogues, forming a thriving community. Okay, so before we jump back to Alexandria, let's talk really, really briefly and broadly about what's happening uh, with Jewish immigration to the U.S. Um, and these are broad strokes. This does not apply to everybody that ever came to the U.S., but it is sort of really broad, but it provides context for discussing Alexandria later. So Jewish immigration to what becomes the United States um, occurred in three main waves between the colonial period and the 20th century. In fact, Jewish migrants have existed in the Americas for almost as long as there has been permanent settlement by Europeans in the Western Hemisphere. For example, Joachim Gans, the earliest known Jewish individual residing in a British colony in the continental US, that's a lot of qualifiers, uh, arrived in 1585 um, on one of the Roanoke colony expeditions. Um, the first period of Jewish migration from the early 1600s through the early 19th century saw the arrival of more men like him, including Elias Legardo of Jamestown in 1621 and John Levy and Moses Nehemiah, who settled in present-day James City and New York counties, respectively. These individuals tended to be fairly wealthy, fairly educated, skilled, or well-connected, and had some form of social or economic capital that was useful for the fledgling British colonial project. They were mostly Sephardic and cosmopolitan, with connections throughout Europe and the Americas. By the late 18th century, Jewish residents in Virginia also enjoyed some freedom from religious persecution after the introduction of the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom. This first wave of migration is really fascinating, but not particularly useful when talking about Alexandria. If you want to learn more about it, there are other books out there on this topic that I'm happy to provide recommendations. The second wave um, of migration consisted of German or Central European Jews who arrived from the 1840s through the 1880s. Political turmoil and economic uncertainty in the 1840s in continental Europe drove a large number of people, both Jewish and not, to migrate to the United States, where, they were more e where there were more economic opportunities and the promise of religious freedom and political stability. In fact, Germans were actually the second largest immigrant to the U.S. after the Irish in the 19th century. For example, in 1853, nearly 35,000 German immigrants arrived through the port of New Orleans alone. And by the start of the Civil War, 50,000 German Jews lived in New York City and up to 10,000 lived in Cincinnati. The majority had been skilled artisans or modest merchants back in Europe. Upon their arrival to the United States, many attempted to set themselves up in business. Sometimes this meant beginning as a transient dry goods peddler before establishing their own stores. The second wave of Jewish immigrants tended to be somewhat educated and skilled, and mostly from Central Europe, and likely to be reform or reform leaning. During the final major period of migration from the 1880s through the 1920s, hundreds of thousands of Eastern European and Russian Jews arrived to American shores, many fleeing the volatile political situation of that region for the relatively stable post-Civil War United States. This wave of immigration was cut off um, by new national quotas that were instituted in the 1920s that sought to limit undesirable immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe that threatened prevailing American racial ideologies. Many of these immigrants were relatively poor former peasants who lacked much secular education. They were often emigrating from Russia and surrounding countries to escape violence in the form of pogroms and other legal and economic restrictions on Jewish life. Many, though not all, came from what is called the Pale of Settlement, which is actually what is in that map right there. Um, that is now uh, Western Russia, Belarus, and Poland. Um, and surrounding areas. Um, and these were areas in which, um, beginning in the 18th century, uh, Jews were legally authorized to live in these areas in Tsarist Russia. Although Ashkenazi, many of these new immigrants held more conservative beliefs than their primarily uh, reform or reform-leaning Central European predecessors. 
Um, in larger cities, this group of immigrants tended to be working class, often marginalized and impoverished. This is the really popular stereotype of New York's Lower East Side um, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, peddlers and push carts, um, and that, that is sort of perpetuated in um, books and movies and sort of popular media. Um, however, these big city experiences are not the only ones possible for new immigrants. Um, and focusing on smaller communities um, is more applicable when drawing parallels to Alexandria. Um, historian Lee Weisbach, uh, his study of small town Jewish communities at the turn of the 20th century, suggests that small town Jews, be they Central or Eastern European, uh, tended to be more or less firmly middle class. They were often merchants, wholesalers, or involved in the liberal professions. Second, small town Jews saw themselves as integrated within their broader community. They were members of both uh, Jewish organizations and secular or even Christian ones when they were members of YMCAs. Lastly, patterns of religious worship, marriage, and burial were different and sometimes creative in small towns due to the limited number of Jewish individuals at any given point in time. And this is a plug for the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience that opened in New Orleans a couple years ago. If this topic is of any interest to you, that is a wonderful museum. I had the opportunity to go earlier this year, and it was like walking through my research in museum form. Um, so Jewish settlement in Alexandria generally followed these wider trends with some local twists. Um, several excellent detailed histories of Alexandria, Northern Virginia, and DC Jewish communities already exist. Um, so I'm not going to rehash all of these in detail here. This is just a sampling of some of them. Um, instead, I really wanna use a couple of vignettes to briefly illustri illustrate the history of Jewish settlement in Alexandria through the 1920s. So most histories begin in the mid 19th century but some evidence suggests that there may have been a few Jewish residents here in town before then. Other cities around the state, including Norfolk and Richmond, had growing Jewish communities in the late 18th century. So it's pretty likely that an important port city like Alexandria would have too. Uh, one example is Jacob Cohen, who was actually a Revolutionary War um, cavalry captain who is identified as being Jewish um, in some early histories of the state. Um, including this one, um, The Jews of Virginia from the Earliest Times to the Close of the 18th Century, which was published in 1911. Um, so Jacob uh, was likely born in Cumberland County um, sometime around 1740, uh, but little else is known about his upbringing before his military service. Uh, Jacob passed away in 1798 in Alexandria, and his children, William, Robert, and Margaret, continued to live in and around the city until the mid-19th century. Um, and this, the piece on the bottom is actually um, William Cohen uh, attempting to gather evidence in order to collect his father's, civil, um, his father's Revolutionary War pension. Um, so the historic record, though, seems to indicate, though, that Jacob's children um, did not see themselves as Jewish and did not participate in any Jewish organizations as adults. Um, instead, they chose to be married and buried in Christian churches and cemeteries. Um, Jacob Cohen's depart children's departure from their father's religion, uh, maybe because no Jewish organizations existed locally, um, or because they had um, of their own personal religious convictions, um, or because it was politically or socially expedient to be Christian, um, which we do see in other places around the state where people will convert in order to be elected. Um, the Cohen siblings' uh, reasoning may be lost to the past, um, but they really provide an interesting example uh, where further historical, res historical research um, could lead to more information about early Jewish Alexandrians. So few continental European immigrants settled long-term in Alexandria before the 1830s. Though Alexandria was an immigration port of minor importance in the 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, most immigrants, including um, a wave of Germans, quickly moved west. Um, as manufacturing and shipping expanded and diversified between the 1840s and the Civil War, Alexandria's population also expanded. The city experienced its most rapid population growth of the 19th century between 1850 and 1860, 
growing by 45% to include 12,652 residents in 1860. Um, and you actually are seeing that too here with the number of um, estimated number of Jewish individuals drawn from a couple of different sources. That is also increasing from sort of 1850 to 1870 pretty steeply. So Alexandria's Jewish community also grew quickly during this time, beginning to organize itself to meet its most pressing needs. Members founded the Hebrew Benevolent Society in 1857, and the society's first order of business was purchasing a plot on Wilkes Street for Home of Peace. Um, the 1850 census, which is the first to list every free person residing in a household by name, recorded 75 uh, German-born individuals. Um, and some of these individuals also happened to be Jewish, including Meyer Kaufman, whose ad is um, from his 1852 ad, for um, selling all sorts of things, including winter clothing um, and oilcloth suits here from the Gazette. Um, one other of these individuals um, is Jonas Glick, who was uh, listed as a 38-year-old merchant tailor from Germany um, in the 1850 census. Uh, he is listed as living with his wife, Henrietta, and their four children, Matilda, Lippmann, Henry, and Virginia. The Glicks lived in the city for less than a decade before moving to D.C., um, where Jonas actually became a pretty prominent figure in the D.C. Jewish community, uh, which is what these two newspaper articles are showing here. Um, so one is for um, his son Lippmann's bar mitzvah uh, in 1859, and the other is uh, for Jonas Glick being the person to contact um, if uh, you're looking to sell some land um, for a cemetery. Uh, so Jonas Glick also provides another illustration of how everyday Jewish Alexandrians live their lives, um, including how in they engaged with the institution of slavery. The 1850 census provides basic information indicating that Glick enslaved one 30-year-old woman. A July 2nd, 1850 Gazette notice uh, gives more details, including the name of the enslaved woman, Nancy Jackson. Jackson had been hired out to Glick by John Birch of Alexandria County, but had fled with her child. Glick was invested enough in the institution of slavery to hire enslaved labor and provide a reward for Jackson's return. So moving into the Civil War, a brief 1862 newspaper series entitled Sketches from the Seat of War, simply authored by a Jewish soldier, provides a glimpse of wartime Alexandria as seen through the eyes of a Union soldier. The first installment on February 21st, 1862 is not kind in its assessment of our, our city here. Um, criticizing everything from the unreliable ferry service to DC to the poor quality of the streets, which is I think a timeless complaint about cities is the quality of the streets. Um, <laughs> the author does note that no city on this continent except New York and New Orleans is so favorably situated for commercial purposes uh, but continues that um, it hasn't reached its full potential because of the depressing effects of slavery. Um, he then goes on to note that the union presence in Alexandria was good for the economy, including several Jewish-owned businesses. On the main commercial corridor, and here I believe he's talking about King Street, the author could, quote, easily identify half the firms as belonging to the well-known Jewish nomenclature. Two kosher boarding houses were already established here, which is not bad for a place where a year ago there was not a single representative of the chosen race, end quote. The unnamed soldier is partially correct in his assessment. By the 1860s, several Jewish-owned businesses did line King Street between Washington Street and the Potomac River. However, these individuals did not all arrive after the start of the Civil War. As we've learned so far, Alexandria was already home to a small number of Jewish individuals and families well before 1860. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, Alexandria suffered a period of economic and social uncertainty. Many who arrived during the war left the city. However, Alexandria continued to grow, and by 1870 was home to at least 32 German Jewish households, consisting of about 176 individuals. Before establishing a synagogue in the city, individuals had traveled to DC to attend services at the Washington Hebrew Congregation and later held rent services in rented facilities or above the businesses that they owned. Purchasing land in a building uh, for dedicated worship space became the main goal of the congregation. The community raised funds in a variety of ways, including fundraisers like a Purim ball, which is actually what this first annual ball 
probably is here in 1871. Um, eventually, the congregation succeeded in its goal and built uh, the, a new synagogue on Washington Street, um, celebrating its dedication in September, on September 1st, 1871. Um, the predominantly German-Jewish community expanded and contracted between the 1880s and 1920s. By 1900, Jewish individuals made up about 1% of Alexandria's residents. As older community members passed away and their children moved, some religious, civic, and social institutions suffered. Those children who remain took over the businesses their parents had established decades earlier and remained involved in commercial and civic affairs, forming a fairly stable and financially secure group. However, the stability changed with the arrival of new immigrants from Russia and Eastern Europe. Between the 1880s and 1920s, established German Jewish communities in the United States witnessed the arrival of millions of newcomers fleeing the volatile political situations in Russia and Eastern Europe. Of these millions, about 25 men and their associated families settled in Alexandria by the end of World War I, with the first arriving around 1898. Religious, economic, and social tensions arose between Alexandria's German Jewish community and these new immigrants. Um, as Pam mentioned earlier, um, Ruth Sinberg Baker, local historian and uh, who did a lot of the research behind the 500 block of King Street, also did a lot of research into Alexandria's Jewish communities. Um, and she notes that, quote, although a few Russian Jews temporarily associated themselves with Bethel, for the larger group of Eastern Europeans, the rituals and observances of the Reformed Jews was as foreign and unacceptable to them as membership in a Christian church, end quote. And by 1916, uh, these newcomers had established their own congregation to serve their own religious needs. Uh, ben Heyman's oral history suggests other tensions between the established German community and the Russian newcomers. He recalls that in the early days, quote, the Reformed Jews were much better educated. Most of the Orthodox didn't have much schooling, and they, meaning the Reformed, looked down upon the Orthodox, end quote. This hints at some underlying tension between the two groups in the early decades of the 20th century. The 1920 census also points to another trend, the increasing number of American-born Jewish Alexandrians, including at least 11 heads of household. These individuals were the children and grandchildren of mostly German immigrants who were committed to their Jewish faith and also active participants in broader political and civic life. One example is Robert P. Whitestone, a wholesale grocer, grocer and his family. Uh, Robert was born in Culpeper, Virginia, sometime around 1873, and he was the son of two Prussian immigrants, Isaac, who was a dry goods merchant, and Joanna. He arrived in Alexandria sometime between 1910 when the census has him living in Culpeper, and 1913 when he first appears on a city directory as the proprietor of the Hotel Rammel. One of Robert's sons, Isaac, seems to have identified as Jewish his entire life, having a bar mitzvah in 1920 and eventually being buried alongside his family at Home of Peace. Um, and we actually have um, Isaac Whitestone's marriage certificate here from Richmond. Um, he is, you can see at the bottom, certificate of time and place of marriage and denomination is clearly written Jewish. So Isaac seems to have identified as, J Robert's son Isaac, identified as Jewish from sort of birth till death um, and everything in between. Um, and un otherwise though, Robert's other son Julian uh, was actually married in a Christian church and was buried at St. Mary's Catholic Cemetery. His path and changing religious affiliations were more like those of the early 19th century Cohen family that we discussed earlier. Um, these two brothers illustrate different paths for Jewish Alexandrians. One maintained his Jewish identity while the other drifted away from his ethnic and religious roots. Julian and Isaac Whitestone show the complexity of identity and how it can change over time. So I hope these vignettes sort of provided a glimpse into the history of Jewish Alexandria, and um, hopefully they helped set the stage for meeting the Rosenfeld family, who lived at 518, 520 King Street in the first two decades of the 20th century. Evidence of their lives um, lingers in the historic record um, and in the material remains excavated by archeologists and volunteers in the late 1970s. So in October of 1903, Max Rosenfeld announced the grand opening of his new dry goods shop in Schwartz's old stand. Pretty uh, 
perf- loudly here in his advertisement. He is telling you that he is occupying somebody else's space. Um, because probably that location meant something to Alexandrians living at the time. They knew where it was. Um, the location had previous, previously been home to Isaac Schwartz and his family, um, who resided there since the 1850s. Um, Schwartz was a successful dry goods merchant and an active member of Alexandria's early Jewish community. Um, And he'd only recently passed in 1898, leaving the property and the business to his son Samuel, who continued to occupy the property until about 1903. The Rosenfeld family, Max, Jenny, and their son Norman, rented the three-story brick structure from the Schwartzes. So born in Alexandria to German parents, Jenny Rosenfeld, maiden name Eichberg, was well connected to her community. Her father, Isaac Eichberg, gentleman that we see in this picture, um, actually helped found Bethel Hebrew Congregation, and her mother, Babette, was well respected in Alexandria, noted for her philanthropy and benevolence. Jenny's husband, Max, was born around 1861, or 1858, if you believe his death certificate, in Prussia. The 1920 census indicates that he immigrated to the U.S. in 1881 and was naturalized in 1892. He's first mentioned in Alexandria at the time of his wedding in August of 1893. Um, at the Alexandria Gazette and the Evening Star uh, both detail the small and private event performed by D.C.'s Rabbi Stern, quote, according to the Jewish faith, end quote. The articles also mention that Max is from Trenton, New Jersey, and that the young couple intended to settle there and not Alexandria after the wedding. The 1895 New Jersey State Census confirms this move, listing Max, Jenny, and their young son Norman living in Trenton's first ward. However, after 1895, the family do not appear in any other Trenton City directories, suggesting that they may have moved elsewhere. So census, Max, Jenny, and Norman listed there. Apparently, New Jersey did censuses on the five-year as, as opposed to, uh, I guess, to fill in the blanks between the 10-year periods. Um, so the elsewhere that Max, uh, Jenny, and Norman may have moved, it seems to be back to Alexandria. Um, Jenny and Max appear in the 1900 census as living with her parents, Babette and Isaac Eichberg, at 114 North Washington Street. And in 1903, Max Rosenfeld decided to strike out on his own, and the family began living and working at 518 520 King Street, renting the property from Samuel Schwartz. The 1910 city tax records confirm this arrangement, listing Schwartz as the owner of the lot, while Max Rosenfeld was taxed for the furniture, indicating that he was occupying and renting the property. However, though Max Rosenfeld was from New Jersey, he and Sam Schwartz were not strangers. In fact, Schwartz and Jenny Rosenfeld were actually cousins. The rental arrangement between the two parties was reinforced and facilitated by familial connections. Though Max was not from Alexandria, he and his family were familiar with and known to the community due to his wife's deep connections. The Rosenfelds operated a store on the first floor and lived above their business. Max sold dry goods, everything from curtains to corsets. He advertised his business as a one price for all store with goods marked in plain figures, pointing to his intent to deal fairly with all customers. And this is actually an 1877 Hopkins map um, of the site. So we're talking about the 500 block of King. um, So between right St. Asaph and Pitt Street. And in the 1877 uh, Hopkins Atlas, the lot is actually very prominently listed as being belonging and occupied by Isaac Schwartz. Um, So just to orient you, that is where the place we are talking about. So the Rosenfelds were active members of Alexandria's Jewish community. Their son Norman had his bar mitzvah in May 1909 in D.C., and the family celebrated this rite of passage at home. Ten years later, the Rosenfelds celebrated Norman's marriage to Allison Louise Greenberg of Buffalo, New York, which was held um, at Rabbi Simon's um, uh, home in uh, D.C. Rabbi Simon is actually the rabbi for the Washington Hebrew Congregation at that time. Um, interestingly, though the Rosenfeld family lived in Alexandria for over two decades, um, they do not appear to be, have been members of Bethel, or at least no documents exist suggesting that they were, which Catherine actually helped me uh, look up and see if there was anything l- linking them to Bethel, and if 
there seems to not be. Um, so according to their death records and newspaper announcements, though, both Max and Norman were intended to be buried at Home of Peace. But Wesley Pippinger's early 1990s cemetery survey suggests that this may not have happened. He was not able to locate a um, grave marker for them. Um, so it's a little confusing about where the death records say one thing, the newspapers say the same thing, and then there's no headstone. <laughs> um, so just sort of a weird historical mystery. Um, Jenny Rosenfeld, um, who didn't pass away until 1954, um, was actually cremated, um, which was and is kind of an unusual choice for a Jewish individual, um, especially as we're gonna learn more about her and her um, affiliations and work with some uh, organizations. So um, a great deal can be learned about the Rosenfeld's lives from the historic record, um, but since I'm an archeologist, I also look for clues in the detritus of everyday life. Um, people use objects to represent and create their identity and archeological artifacts provide tangible, ev tangible evidence of people's lived experiences. So a group of archeologists and volunteers led by the very first city archeologist who I appear, has appeared to have left the room uh, unearthed some of this evidence um, on the south side of the 500 block of King Street between 1977 and 1978. Um, again, where the courthouse is today. Um, this work was part of a larger grassroots effort to preserve Alexandria's buried history ahead of an urban renewal project that transformed the 300, 400, and 500 blocks of King Street in the 60s and 70s. On the 500 block, um, also known as archeological site 44AX1, the team discovered the remains of dozens of features. So features are things like wells, privies, foundations. One of these features, feature four, was found in the backyard of 518, 520 King Street. And the artifacts likely relate to the use of the property by the Rosenfeld family in the early 20th century. So in the next section, we'll talk, uh, we'll explore the artifact assemblage and associated historic records and what they can tell us about the lives of uh, this family. Particularly, particularly, we'll learn more about the family's evolving economic choices, Jenny Rosenfeld's involvement in the National Council of Jewish Women, and the choices she made about her home, and the ways in which the family navigated the broader early 20th century racial landscape. So Max Rosenfeld never did purchase 518, 520 King Street from Sam Schwartz. However, between 1914 and 1916, the Rosenfelds did acquire four sets of properties in Alexandria, improving the buildings and renting them out. Their purchases included the former slave pen at 1315 Duke Street, which had been transformed into a boarding house and apartments since the end of the Civil War. Um, and this unoccupied property was repeatedly vandalized by unknown persons. Um, and that's what this newspaper article here is actually Max Rosenfeld appealing to the city to do something about his property keeps getting vandalized. Um, but it's also a testament to the weird in connections in Alexandria. If you could be talking about Jewish Alexandria, but then you could be talking about, you know, the domestic slave trade in the next sort of breath because everything's sort of interconnected. Um, in 1916, Rosenfeld purchased 608-610 King Street with ambitious plans to erect a modern two-story building on the lot. Um, by January 1917, he had leased this property to the Woolworth Company for 15 years, who actually demolished the existing uh, structure and began building a new store. Um, Max and Jenny Rosenfeld expanded their economic options by shifting from focusing solely on dry goods um, and looking more towards real estate development, leaving a legacy for their son, Norman. Um, and actually when Norman passes away um, much too early, quite young, um, he's listed as being um, in real estate and not in the dry goods business like his father, right? So that is, there's, there's sort of building capital and wealth there that's happening. Um, the archeological record also speaks to the Rosenfeld family's economic choices. Uh, they use their capital to reinvest in the future and not necessarily to acquire expensive things. Overall, they consumed fewer high value goods such as foreign porcelain than their non-Jewish neighbors of similar um, economic status. Instead, they opted for American made embossed rim white pieces that were simple, elegant, functional, and economical. 
They do not photograph well, but I have brought them. So after the talk, you are welcome to filter up and look at some of the artifacts that are going to be highlighted in here. Um, white plates don't photograph well, who knew? Um, but they're much more interesting to look at um, in person. Um, so the ceramic artifacts um, included plates and soup dishes made by the Wheeling, West Virginia-based Warwick China Company and a bowl made by the Homer Laughlin Company. So Homer Laughlin is really best known for fiesta ware, um, but they made a lot of other things too. Um, both types of ceramics were advertised in the DC papers um, and Warwick China, the more obscure of the two types, appears in local advertisements by 1899 suggesting that these ceramics would have been readily available locally, perhaps at S. Kahn, Sons & Co., or Goldenbergs in D.C. So both Warwick China and the Hudson line of Homer Laughlin ceramics were designed to look like more expensive um, British refined white earthenwares or French porcelain. For example, a 1900 advertisement for Warwick China proclaims the wares to be as thin and delicate as Havilland, but a third of the cost at only 16 cents per plate. So Havilland, if you don't know, was founded in the 1840s and it's best known for manufacturing really delicate uh, Limoges porcelain. Um, a 1901 advertisement in DC's Evening Star newspaper lists a 100 piece uh, Warwick China dinnerware set as costing $11.49, while a comparable set of Austrian China was priced at $17.98. The American-made products were more economical and readily available, allowing middle-class households to emulate more expensive tableware. The Rosenfeld family appear to have been making conscious choices um, to purchase these items, um, perhaps directing their economic resources elsewhere, like buying real estate. The artifact assemblage also included this very dapper uh, porcelain moon man figurine, who is also here with us tonight. Um, it is about five inches tall, powder blue and depicts a crescent moon with a face wearing a suit rising out of what appears to be clouds. And there are two white doves possibly kissing near his chest. It doesn't have a maker's mark um, anywhere on the body, but it was possibly manufactured by German company uh, Schaefer and Vater. Archaeologists uh, working in Philadelphia excavated a very similar piece during work for the I-95 corridor improvement project. Um, and other examples can also be found online at all of your favorite antique auction sites. Um, the Schaefer and Vader Company operated between about 1890 and 1962 um, and is really best known for making figural beer steins and bottles um, of varying levels of taste. If you happen to Google these, there are some pretty tasteless ones out there. Um, <laughs> However, um, in the early 20th century, they also made figurines, um, including the series of celestial men and women in sort of romantic or leisurely poses like this one. Um, this moon man uh, may have been designed to imitate more costly Wedgwood Jasper ware, um, but was readily available by mail order from Sears and Roebuck. Again, the Rosenfelds uh, may have had the means to buy expensive knickknacks, but instead chose to purchase economical items that looked like more expensive products participating in the consumer economy on their own terms. Um, and this is supported by research um, at other Jewish and non-Jewish sites that has found that some households did not participate in conspicuous consumption to the degree expected based on their economic status, instead choosing to apply their money towards other investments. And that's really where, right, archaeology is useful, right? Because you can, you know, from tax records, think somebody is of a particular economic status, but then their artifact assemblage just doesn't match up. Um, and that's, you know, both things can be true at the same time and you need to look for another mechanism of why there might be a discrepancy. Um, Rebecca Yeaman, um, who is a really well-known figure in historical archeology, span um, has noted that mid 19th century Jewish households um, in New York's Five Points area acquired fewer home goods than their Irish neighbors, though they were of similar economic status. Instead, those Jewish households spent their money on domestic help, reinvesting in their business, or buying property. Um, the ways in which the Rosenfelds chose to spend their extra money are pretty consistent with that um, and illustrate that not all households prioritize using their wealth um, to buy expensive things. All right. So I said we were going to talk about why it's weird that Jenny got cremated. Um, well, it's weird because 
she was uh, a pretty uh, involved with the National Council of Jewish Women. Um, so newspaper and archaeological remains also provide a glimpse into Jenny's religious and civic life and the ways in which she may have balanced tradition with newer progressive ideas in the early 20th century. The written records tell us more about her public position within Alexandria and beyond, um, while the archaeological remains, particularly uh, faunal remains, animal bones, help us determine more about her family's private life. Historic records indicate that Jenny uh, was an active member of welfare organizations, continuing her mother's uh, legacy of philanthropy. Her participation aligned with broader trends seen in the first few decades of the 20th century, right? Middle class women expanding their roles beyond the household at that time. So think social reformers, voting rights advocates, all of that. Um, this fits right into that. Um, in the 1910s, Rosenfeld served as secretary pro term and later president of the Alexandria chapter of the Council of Jewish Women, an organization loosely linked to other women's organizations of the time. So this group sought to redefine the role of Jewish women as public and active participants in religious and cultural life. The council hoped to combat assimilation by educating women about their faith in order to strengthen Jewish homes and preserve Jewish heritage. As president of the local chapter, Rosenfeld advocated on behalf of European Jews caught in the crossfire of World War I, helping raise money to ease their plight. Her leadership suggests that she was an active participant in creating a Jewish world for her family and community. Additionally, the council provided women with new opportunities to study, debate, and interpret religious doctrine that had previously not been open to them in such an organized manner. In 1913, Jenny Rosenfeld hosted Sadie American, the executive secretary of the national organization. And that is the lady we see here. Uh, American, a prominent radical, um, a proponent of radical reform Judaism, was critical in shaping the council's social reform and immigrant assistance projects. Historic records do not indicate how philosophically aligned Sadie and Jenny may have been, but the fact that Rosenfeld hosted American suggests that there may have been some affinity. The Council of Jewish Women transcended the local synagogue, providing American Jews with networking opportunities beyond their immediate community. Jenny Rosenfeld's active participation both reflected her identity as a Jewish woman, but also served to shape and reinforced what exactly that meant. It linked her to like-minded women across the country, expanding her social network beyond the immediate region or existing social and economic relationships. Archaeological evidence points to subtle tensions within the Rosenfeld household between new interpretations of what it meant to be Jewish and more conservative practices rooted in tradition. Ceramic artifacts and animal bones suggest the nuanced ways in which this household, likely led by Jenny's preferences and ideas, interpreted kosher rules. There is no evidence that the Rosenfelds had two distinct sets of dishes, one for meat and one for dairy, as would be expected if they str kept strictly kosher. Instead, like many other Jewish, uh, German Jewish households across the United States at the time, they used minimally decorated refined white earthenwares, like the ones mentioned previously. On the other hand, the animal bones do indicate that Jenny was trying to maintain the semblance of a kosher diet for her family, um, connecting them to a millennia of Jewish forebearers. The household consumed significantly less pork and more chicken than their non-Jewish neighbors of similar economic position. The Rosenfelds appeared to have been intentionally avoiding consuming pork, a food with great deal of symbolic significance, right? Um, it's not that they're not consuming none, it's that they're consuming less, right? Um, so this is sort of in the weeds nerdiness about faunal remains. Um, NISP is number of individual specimens, so that's just individual number of bones. Um, and based on that, um, the artifact assemblage from the Lee Fendel house, right, looks like they're consuming about, you know, 10% of their whole assemblage is pig, um, whereas the Rosenfeld assemblage is only about four. Um, and when you break that down to minimum number of individuals, so that is the minimum number of animals that can be represented by the artifact assemblage, uh, the Rosenfeld assemblage contains evidence of only one, of at least one pig, uh, while the Lee Fendel assemblage has uh, the remains of at least six pigs. Um, so this is, like I said, down in the weeds, nerdiness, but um, the faunal assemblage does suggest that they are at least avoiding pig as much as possible. Um, 
So um, the Rosenfeld household also appears to um, have preferred uh, cuts of beef from the front of the animal, um, but did not exclusively consume these cuts. Um, kosher rules govern which portions of an animal are acceptable for consumption and how an animal should be butchered and processed. Um, and typically hindquarter portions of an animal are not considered kosher unless processed very, very specifically to remove the sciatic nerve and forbidden fats. Most people don't bother doing that, right? So front of the animal is always gonna be fine. Back of the animal is questionable. Um, in the early 20th century, Alexandrians wishing to access uh, specially processed foods needed to trek into Washington, D.C., which did have several kosher food purveyors in the first two decades of the early 20th century. Um, so uh, Kahn and Goldsmith here, uh, this is a 1906 ad um, of uh, all of their fine meats. Um, and Alexandria didn't really get its uh, own uh, kosher deli and lunchroom until 1922, um, which is this right here. Um, so this evidence all suggests that the Rosenfelds were attempting to follow kosher rules at home, um, avoiding trafe species and cuts. Um, however, like many other Jewish Americans, they did not keep strictly kosher, instead reinterpreting tradition in ways that made sense for them based on their personal preferences, convictions, and really based on local options. So finally, um, the American racial landscape was a really complex place in the early 20th century, um, and American Jews occupied a fraught position within it. Um, historians Eric Goldstein and Deborah um, Wiener argue that understanding this racial positionality is even more important in a border city like Alexandria, where race relations were often much more complex than they were in either the Deep South or in the North, um, and that these things changed over time, often rather quickly. Um, in fact, um, American society increasingly racialized Jewish individuals, both foreign and native born, after the Civil War and through World War II. Um, and this sort of does have sort of, uh, World War II does serve as sort of a really uh, sharp bookend and backstop, right, as the horrors of the Holocaust are figured out and people come to terms with those. So um, we're gonna be talking about basically everything before World War II. So evidence of how the Rosenfelds may have navigated this world um, lingers in several documentary records. So. Scholars um, have argued, oh, no, where are we? Newspaper records uh, show that Max Rosenfeld actually financially supported the construction of the Arlington Confederate Monument, probably the one seen here that's in the cemetery. Um, scholars have argued that these monuments were intended to intimidate our African Americans, they're linked to incidences of lynching, and reflect a racist history. Uh, by financial financially contributing to this monument, Max Rosenfeld was implicitly endorsing Jim Crow policies and practices, which in turn likely served to solidify the family's position as white within a Alexandria society. However, by the 1920s, the racial landscape around the Rosenfeld family was changing, and anti-Semitism was on the rise. Max and Norman's death certificates suggest that by the time of their deaths, Jewish identity was viewed and understood via a racial lens. Both certificates list their race as white, but with a qualifier of Jewish. Clearly, Jewish as a racial distinction, as opposed to merely a religious affiliation, was important to someone, either the Rosenfelds themselves or government officials. So we need to talk about this really briefly, uh, sort of a broader historic context of what's happening in Virginia in the 1910s and 1920s and 30s. Um, so starting in June of 1912, Virginia began requiring local registrars to file vital records with the state that included information about an individual's race. Bureaucrats used these records against everyday Virginians to enforce the state's miscegenation laws, including the 1924 Virginia Racial Integrity Act that codified the one drop rule. At a time when some racial definitions and classification systems still included Semite, along with Caucasian, it's not really difficult to see how Jewish may have ended up in Max and Norman Rosenfeld's death certificates in the race field. No Virginia law explicitly mentions Hebrews, Jews, or Semites as distinct racial categories, but the definition of white as only Caucasian left room for individual registrars to apply their own interpretation and understanding of race. 
Furthermore, by the 1930s, Virginia eugenicists started paying attention to interactions between Jewish and non-Jewish individuals. For example, by tracking and restricting the number of admitted students to Virginia universities, including UVA, and by arguing that the perceived clannishness of Jewish communities was a threat to American stability. These actions and rhetoric indicate that before World War II, Jewish Virginians were still provisionally white and faced discrimination and monitoring. Individuals like the Rosenfelds likely landed in the crosshairs. Taking this broader context into account, the logic behind the racial distinction on Max's 1926 death certificate is still unclear. The main sections of the certificate were typed, making it difficult to match up handwriting. The addition of Jew to the record may have been an editorialization of the individual typing the form, or it may, re may reflect information dictated by the informant, which in this case was Max's son, Norman. The informant was typically the person responsible for providing as much accurate information as possible to the personal and statistical particulars field um, on the document. Perhaps Norman knew that his father understood his own Jewishness along racial lines. The handwritten Jewish over the typewritten white on Norman's 1929 death certificate suggests that someone wished to erase or qualify Norman's white identity after the fact. The local or state registrar may be the most likely candidate to have altered this document after it was submitted by the informant, who in this case was actually Norman's mother, Jenny, um, and the attending physician. The handwriting of Jewish, uh, at least to me, most closely resembles the handwriting of the registration fields meant to be inserted by the registrar, but I'm not a handwriting expert, so I, I don't know. Um, and, but officials at this time were known to compare documents and fix discrepancies that they thought they saw. Um, Walter Plecker, who was the state registrar for many, many years, was notorious for going back and fixing people's certificates in order to try and impose what he thought was the uh, racial organization and hierarchy that made sense to him. Um, so it's possible that someone remembered that Max, so Norman's father, had been listed as white common Jew and decided that his son needed to carry the same racial designation even though this is not the information that was provided by the informant. Um, so the varied use of the race field on Virginia vital records in the first few decades of the 20th century um, is not unique um, to the Rosenfeld documents. Um, it occurs on lots of other birth and death certificates of many, many others. Um, and this inconsistency, inconsistency or confusion over who counts as fully white points to the inherent instability of socially constructed racial categories. The instability of the racial categorizations and new interest in monitoring the assimilation and upward mobility of Jewish individuals may have led a registrar to label both Max and Norman as racially Jewish, effectively putting an asterisk on their whiteness. Alternatively, perhaps it was the Rosenfeld's own wishes to be identified this way. In the early 20th century, some Jewish scholars, including reform rabbis, defined Jewishness racially as a mode of political resistance and self-defense. This strategy attempted to avoid the pitfalls and political connotations of explaining differences in ethnic terms that could appear traitorous or unpatriotic. Jenny Rosenfeld's involvement with the National Council of Jewish Women noted earlier suggests an above average identification with an interest in Jewish religion and heritage, though with perhaps a progressive bent. Perhaps the identification as racially Jewish on these death certificates is also due to her influence and agenda, while still reflecting the prevailing power of racial thinking in the early 20th century. As we've seen this evening, the history of Jewish Alexandria is complex, both unique to the special city, while also reflective of larger national trends. The American Jewish experience is a rich tapestry that incorporates a vast array of identities and communities. The Rosenfelds and other Jewish Alexandrias were woven into this fabric, and this research contextualizes their unique experiences into the broader story of the diaspora. Max, Jenny, and many other Jewish Americans created new e economic opportunities, balanced tradition and innovation, while creating new cultural paths for themselves and their community, and navigated a fraught position within the changing racial landscape of the early 20th century. 
Historic documents help tell us some of these stories, but the artifacts excavated from 518 520 King Street provide tangible evidence that you can hold in your hand and imagine the world over 100 years ago. Thank you, and any questions? flight tomorrow, uh, yeah, tomorrow morning. So I'm also on the board. I'm Paula Whitaker, and I wanted to be able to say thank you to Tatiana for that like amazing presentation. Um, she obviously, she did her dissertation. She's written a number of articles, and I'm sure we will be hearing from her again. Um, I also wanted to remind folks that October 20th, um, the Alexandra Forum is going to be taking place here from, um, I think, like 9 to 4, and it's going to be about the waterfront. Um, it's uh, $60 or $40 if you are a member of any kind of OHA organization, so it's a great incentive to join. Um, also, our next meeting, the Alexandria Historical Society meeting, will be um, October 27th, whatever that last Wednesday is of October. And we will also be talking about the waterfront, and it will be Abby Schreiber, who um, has been working for the past, uh, I think, like more than a year, really looking through deed and records and you know resources about what was going on in the waterfront. So again, Tat Tatiana's artifacts are here. Welcome to look at them. I believe there's still some refreshments. And thank you for coming to our first meeting of this season. <laughs>